so that you Eric, I'm gonna, okay. So good morning, welcome everyone to Geriatric Medicine Grand Rounds um, and a special welcome to uh, anyone who's visiting us today. We're excited to have you. Um, I, we have a fantastic talk today. Um, this is gonna be a really, really great hour. Dr. Eric Wadera, uh, many of you know, he's said hi to a bunch of you already. Um, you know him from his work in geriatrics and palliative medicine. He's a professor of medicine at UCSF um, and the director of hospice and palliative care services at the San Francisco VA. Um, he's also the associate program director of the geriatric medicine fellowship at UCSF, although for a long time was the program director um, and in that role, I've gotten a chance to collaborate with him on um, some work with the program directors nationally, and it's always great to, to see Eric and, and to get to work with him. He is known for many things. Um, he's, he's done a lot of fantastic work in geriatrics. You might be familiar with his work on e-prognosis as a, as a co-developer of that. Um, many of you probably listened to his Jerry Powell podcast, which is fantastic, um, and he does that with Alex Smith uh, at UCSF, um, and really, Eric has made many contributions to geriatrics and palliative medicine, but today he's here to talk to us about developing our online presence. He's really good at this, um, and I'm just so excited that you're taking the time to share with us today. Well, I want to thank everybody for joining today and thank you for inviting me to this grand rounds. It really is an honor. Um, I feel like, uh, you know, I know most of the people on this call, which is always fabulous to talk, um, about topics that I feel passionate about. Um, and, uh, that I think actually, you know, one of those things is promoting geriatrics and the amazing things that we do in both geriatrics and palliative care. Um, and happy to talk about it today. You know, we're a smaller group, so feel free to, this doesn't have to be like the normal grand rounds where you have to be quiet until the end, feel free to jump in. I do have some exercises involved in these slides. Um, so I'm gonna ask for your participation. Um, I got the chat box up too. So if you want, you can ask questions there or just jump in on the video feed too. Um, happy to actually see everybody's faces this morning. So my talk is on Twitter to tenure, developing your online geriatrics presence. Um, my name is at Uwadera. Uh, <laughs> and a little bit about me, um, I'm at UCSF. I also run the uh, Journal of American Geriatrics. There's social media platforms, including if you ever see a tweet from JAGS that's coming out of my laptop. Um, I'm on the board for AHPM. I do the Jerry Powell podcast. And I'm a huge UW Geriatrics and Palliative Care fan club member. So um, uh, again, a very big thank you for, for inviting me today. All right, I'm going to start off. And you can either put this in the, in the chat box or you can just share online. So why aren't you on social media from a professional standpoint? You can talk about this you personally or Again, I, from a division standpoint, from a fellowship standpoint, and this is not personal. This is not like sharing your vacation pictures on a Facebook page with your family, but from a professional standpoint. Wayne says, time is my enemy. Isabella says, Ooh, I lost it. Time required to maintain an account. Nosley takes a lot of time. Look, there it seems to be a theme. Uh, I try to minimize the role of social media in my social life. It's hard for me to cross into it using professional reasons. Taking a break, it's a lot. Love it, that includes a Twitter handle. <laughs> The learning curve seems daunting by David. I tend to just use social media for non-work stuff. So the happy stuff, it's distracting. I love all of those answers. And when I think about it, um, oh, Jenny, thank you. And what if I say something stupid? I worry of being pulled into other political noise. And there's a lot of noise out there. So 
when I think about social media, you know, there is potentially a lot of threats and a lot of reasons not to do it, either from a personal standpoint or potentially from a division or fellowship standpoint. There's potential threats to professionalism. And we've been seeing people um, talk about patients in a way that's not HIPAA compliant um, or do things that are very unprofessional on social media and actually have been fired for it. Threats to patient confidentiality, which I mentioned. Threats to patient clinician boundaries. What if they friend you? What, what if they send you stuff about you know, their clinical case, what's happening with them? There's a ton of fake news and propagation of inaccurate information. And like you all said, it's a huge time sink. So why, why even bother with it? And most importantly, I love this cartoon. Are you coming to bed? I can't, this is important. What someone is wrong on the internet. So potentially going down this rabbit hole of trying to fix everything that people are posting. So all potential reasons that you should avoid social media at all cost. However, I'm gonna be talking about five things that I use social media for um, and five things that I think I'm kind of passionate about for using it. With that said, I actually have to like, since I've started doing the JAG social media account, I tweet less on my own. There's only so much time in the day. And I think really trying to prioritize what are you using it for? Just like any other tool, um, you got to know when to use it and how it's going to help you personally um, and professionally. So these are the five things. Promote, learn, disseminate, teach, and connect. I'm going to be talking about each one of these. Again, feel free to jump in. I'd love to hear your own anecdotes, kind of how you use it or other reasons why you think it's a bad idea to use it. I am not all pro pro uh, social media. There are times and I continue to have times where I feel like deleting Facebook is the right thing from a public standpoint, um, but I'm still in it. Um, and it's one of those things I wanna be very mindful about. Okay, let's start off with promote. So when we think about social media, I think the one, one thing that often comes up is um, this idea of self-promotion. So is self-promotion a bad thing? Think about it for a second. Um, as I always thought it was, like, why should I, you know, I just published an article in this journal. I feel bad about, um, you know, sharing that. Um, uh, you know, people are going to think I'm maybe arrogant or talk too much, or I only talk about myself. And I think that's the really hard part. I think that a lot of, especially junior faculty members feel that. Um, and sometimes it's like, okay, why do I want to promote like what I ate for dinner last night? And I think that's part of the issue with social media is that um, uh, sometimes it feels like the only thing is about self-promotion. So I want to caution against this approach and I want to caution. And I think I see Wayne in the comments section. It's a good thing. Um, this is Louise Aronson. She's a faculty member here at UCSF. And a long time ago, she gave a talk um, and she redefined self-promotion to really the definition of using the self to promote. I, I love this. And I think this is kind of what I use social media for, whether it be from a podcasting standpoint, Twitter standpoint, is really highlighting the amazing things that we do in geriatrics and palliative care and promoting those things and those ideas to make the care of older adults and those with serious illness better. Um, so I, I take Luis Aronson's words uh, um, to heart, and I think it's an important thing. I'm going to give you some examples. Um, this came out a while ago. Uh, 2018. It was a position paper in the Annals of Internal Medicine um, uh, on reducing firearm injuries and deaths in the United States, a position paper from the American College of Physicians. Do you guys remember this? Do you remember what happened after this paper came out? Stay in your lane. Yeah. So NRA sent out a tweet. Someone should tell self-important anti-gun doctors to stay in their lane. 
Half of the articles in internal medicine are pushing for gun control. Most upsetting, however, the medical community seems to have consulted no one but themselves. Stay in your lane, doctors. Don't talk about firearm injury. I think, you know, it could have ended there. It Like if doctors weren't on Twitter, it could have just stopped. NRA may have had the last word, but that didn't. That didn't happen. So what you started seeing is a lot of doctors posting online their own thoughts about staying in their lane. This is one tweet. I held a 22-year-old's heart and used my hand to pump blood through a bullet-riddled body. We resuscitated this person for nearly an hour, and they made it to the OR, but would never make it home to their family. Tell me whose lane this is, NRA. This is our lane. Research affirm. Or this one, hey NRA, want to see my lane? Here's the chair I sit in when I tell patients that their kids are dead. How dare you tell me I can't research the evidence-based solutions? Hashtag, this is my lane. Hashtag, this is our lane. Hashtag, the quiet room. And again, it didn't end there. There's also more of the traditional publications too. So afterwards, there was perspective in the New England Journal of Medicine, hashtag this is our lane, firearm safety as a healthcare highway, including people like uh, um, Dr. Betts um, and others who actually included a picture of some of these tweets. Um, and again, another one from Dr. Betts, firearms and dementia, clinical considerations. You know moving this idea forward about the importance, not just in general medicine, but in the work that we do in geriatrics about the importance of firearm safety, especially around individuals with dementia. And then you can go outside again out of traditional academic uh, route. So we had Dr. Betts on uh, um, our podcast, hashtag this is our lane, firearm safety and dementia. So when I think about social media, I think about it as a kind of new paradigm around um, uh, publication ecosystems. <laughs> so it's not enough anymore just to say, hey, I got this paper published in JAMA or New England Journal. Um, you know, if you look at, you know, even the big journals, how many people are reading any particular article? You know, the big, big ones, you're looking, you know, three, maybe 5,000 downloads. Um, and, you know, that's great, but it's not going to, change the world by itself. If you look at the smaller journals, you can actually pull up for a lot of the journals, how many downloads did you get for any particular article looking like at their altmetric scores, the altmetric button, how many people are talking about it. Uh, Alex Smith often jokes that um, on average, a paper is read three times, once by the, uh, the writer, the author, once by the author's mom, and once by maybe the editor. Um, so if you really want to put in all this effort to actually make a change, to do a publication, maybe you've spent years on it. I think it's really important. And that's part of our goal from a JAG social media standpoint, really important also to think about post-publication dissemination. How are you getting the word out about the things that you're passionate about and the things that your colleagues are passionate about? And I think importantly, um, I think this is a great example. If we don't help shape the discussion, it will be shaped without us. So I'm going to ask another exercise. I'd like everybody to write one sentence about an idea that you have and you want to advocate for. And if you're comfortable, put it in the chat. Take one minute to do this. Any idea. Doesn't just have to be about geriatrics palliative care. It certainly can be about geriatrics palliative care, but something that you're passionate about. Betsy Yang, appreciate aging. Rue, the nursing homes don't all provide bad care. 
maybe highlighting the amazing things that happen in nursing homes because they always just get bad press. Jesse, the fact that every hospitalization event for older adults can have severe complications and should be avoided if at all possible. Marjorie, there were a record number of med school applicants last year. To address physician shortage, we need more residency programs to train docs. I love those things. I see Austin, less talk of COVID only kills the elderly, implying that it's okay statement and public sentiment on social media. All right, I'm going to continue on. Keep on putting them in the slides or in the, the chat box. Um, and, uh, ooh, I see more. I'm just going to read a couple of these. That adult day health is unsung hero of community-based services. David, we have a crisis with professionals leaving healthcare in the COVID era. Man, I, I feel, I just tweeted that one out and uh, it's getting a lot of likes too. I feel like our next wave right now is not a COVID wave, but a healthcare professional leaving the field or just changing jobs wave. Uh, medication reconciliation EMRs is a place where many errors can occur. We need systems to improve it. Geriatrics is much needed and the best specialty. Yay. Um, so, uh, you know, those are all great things that we can promote. Again, we're using our self to promotion. Self promotion isn't necessarily a bad thing. And I think it's critical for geriatrics and palliative care to promote these things that we are so passionate about. And it's not just enough to complain about people not talking about, let's say, nursing homes that actually great things happen in them. But I think just like the NRA tweet, we have an obligation also to promote the things that we care about. And man, certainly, if you're going to put in two years of effort for a publication, you should do a little bit of effort around making sure that people read that publication once it's published. And I think that's where promoting our colleagues and our divisions come in. So we can often think about it as self-promotion, things that we're going to do to promote the things that we've worked on. I also think there's probably a bigger role and probably easier for us to do is promote the amazing things that our colleagues and that our division is doing and making sure that our divisions are actually doing it as well. So I want to highlight, uh, I looked at, first of all, your logo is amazing and your website is absolutely amazing. Um, well done on the redesign. I like a lot of geriatrics uh, websites uh, for, for divisions and they're a little bit, you know, stale and older. Yours is like, on top of it looks just absolutely gorgeous. So uh, really well done with the website. And it's clear kind of where you go, what you can do. Um, uh, and it's fabulous. And I also think this is our division website. So you can see, I actually think yours is prettier. So uh, but don't tell anybody. And unfortunately, I was actually part of developing this website. But you go to our website, it starts a video. But the website is just one component of what we're trying to do. Just like a publication, there's an ecosystem that needs to be around it. Um, there's an ecosystem around our division website. Um, so when you look at our division website, you can go to the website. You can, for example, learn about our fellowship. We also have links to our Facebook pages for our division. We have a YouTube page that you can go to. We have a Twitter page that you can go to. And they all support each other. And there's also a newsletter uh, called Jerry News that gets sent out to a listserv that highlights all of these things. And it's really about an ecosystem of promoting the great things that the vision of geriatrics is doing. And if you go to our Twitter account, it's not just within, our, within the division too but it's a lot about it. So if you, again, take a look at our Geriatrics Medicine Fellowship website, again, I gotta say, yours looks a little snazzier, you beat us to it. Um, uh, uh, add a little bit of levity. This is our graduation photo from uh, uh, two years ago. Uh, each of our fellows were like, a, we gave them a superhero name and making sure that we're covering all the most important parts uh, that we wanna talk about in 
each of our web pages, like for our fellowship, the mission and aims, who we're looking for, what the curriculum looks like. For example, why you should come to Seattle or San Francisco. But then you can go to other places too. So for example, you can go to our newsletter um, and you can read about the different things that our faculty are doing. So Rebecca Sudori presents Prepare for Your Care at a website at Cleveland Clinic. So that's one example of it. And this actually then gets emailed out to um, all of our listserv uh, folks. And then it also gets tweeted out. And again, it's not just within the stuff within geriatric or the division of geriatrics at UCSF. It's also trying to promote other things that great people are doing. So this is from Nathan Stahl, um, uh, our new uh, uh, CMAG study reporting that for-profit long-term care homes have larger and deadlier COVID-19 outbreaks than nonprofit homes. Um, again, trying to create um, communication with others on Twitter. It's, again, shouldn't just be about yourself, but it can be. So these are some tweets that came out uh, from UCSF, highlighting Dr. Leah Witt, co-host of the Curbsiders podcast with guests Kelly Graham and Lexmi Santosh discussing professional and personal challenges women in medicine are facing during the COVID-19 pandemic. And you can see some examples of other tweets that are coming out of our UCSF Division of Geriatrics website. Again, part of an overall approach to try to promote the amazing work that our colleagues are doing, not just via our website, but via email, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter. I think one of the challenges, it can't just be a top-down approach. So if we just focused on the division and its Twitter account, I don't think much would, would happen. So a while ago, we actually started getting faculty on social media. Um, and, you know, it takes a while. Like there is a, a learning curve. Uh, there is... Uh, a lot of potential resistance, but I gotta say, once people are on it and they can see some of the power that it has, especially to promote the amazing work that their colleagues are doing, we've learned, and these are all of our division of geriatrics Twitter handles, we've learned that people actually get on it. Um, and we have a lot of our faculty on social media, not just personally, but professionally, and sharing the amazing work that, um, each of these individuals are doing and the folks that who are not on Twitter. So how did we do this is yeah, early on, we kind of gamified it. So, uh, you know, this is pre COVID when we were all together in the same room, we actually had groups go into tables and they fought to get all of these, the most amount of points and the most amount of time. So everybody in the table had to sign up for Twitter. Uh, everybody had to send a tweet. Everybody had to follow someone else on the table. Everybody had to retweet something. Everybody had to use a hashtag in a tweet. Everybody had to have favorite a tweet or upload a photo or tweet a photo or tweet a link. All of these things, um, you know, a lot of faculty didn't take it up, you know, a month later or two months later. But I think over time, it, it helped with their familiarity around using it. And again, I think that's part of the reason that we have so many of our faculty me, faculty using social media. So really thinking about this potentially as, if you're interested, kind of a division quality improvement project. And the quality is how do we promote each other's amazing work? And you guys are doing it too. So um, I see a, a tweet, a retweet from Nosley, um, uh, but uh, Joshua wrote this, enjoyed reading this editorial from UW Department of Medicine uh, from Nosley's uh, Twitter handle and Randy Curtis about human-centered design, insights greater than ideation, which is greater than implementation and goals of care discussions. That's fabulous, promoting each other's work. Another one, Kate Bennett. Thank you, UW Department of Medicine for these spotlights. Grateful for all of my geriatrics, hashtag med ed colleagues, mentors and trainees at UW and around the country that partner in improving care for older adults. Thanks to them. I get to do what I love every day. And this is in response to UW Department of Medicine tweet, um, honoring hashtag women in medicine and hashtag healthy aging month. So this is amazing and really encourage more of this should be happening. Everybody should be promoting each other's work. Um, again, it doesn't just have to be on Twitter. It could be through a lot of different venues. All right, so I'm gonna ask you another exercise. 
write one tweet about something you were impressed with that one of your colleagues did. I'm gonna give everybody a minute. I see Lauren Carpenter writing, my fellowship director made me sign up for a Twitter account during fellowship. I apologize, uh, Dr. Carpenter. <laughs> and case supporting junior faculty is essential to sustainable divisions and reducing burnout. Man, really making people, you know, as a junior faculty member, I remember I got on Twitter fairly early and uh, like, I remember the first time Diane Meyer retweeted me, Diane Meyer, huge person in palliative medicine um, at Mount Sinai. And I felt good. Um, it felt like, man, this is a way that I could connect with people in a way that, you know, I probably wouldn't have had the ability to if it wasn't through social media. To have like a communication with folks like Diane Meyer and others who are doing an amazing, amazing things. Um, but who are so far away. Okay, let's read some of these. Again, write a tweet about something you were impressed with when your colleagues did. I'm so impressed with Dr. Andrew Hunter for staying in the hospital until 7 p.m. to facilitate inter-hospital transfer last night. Give me one more thing, one more thing that you think, not you, Jesse, but somebody else that you were impressed. Maybe it was a publication. Maybe it was something around self-care. Maybe it was something about promoting somebody else's work. I'm impressed that Dr. Carpenter is working full-time and is a mom and treating ser serious illness. Dr. Carpenter always impresses me. So keep them coming. And I think this is what we want. This is what we want to show people that, hey, what you do, your missions, your values, the things that you're working on in your self-care are important. And we're going to not just tell you that, but we're going to promote that. And we're going to promote the ideals and values of our division that way too. So it's kind of a win-win. David Grunewald wrote an amazing perspective piece in JAMA. I'm trying to remember, what was that perspective piece on? Did I read it already? I got to read it, I think. It was on my mother's uh, last phase of life. I did read that. That was amazing. Um, uh, uh, yeah, actually, I got it. Rebecca Sudori emailed it to me. That, that one hit a lot of people's kind of, uh, uh, it was really powerful. Um, so thank you. thank you. I'm impressed at all things Kate Bennett does and with such kindness and grace. Austin Armstrong, amazing the best way that Dr. Um, sorry if I pronounce it right, Onima's rollout this week of his geriatric pain treatment order set that he crafted and has now implemented in our hospital. So um, amazing job. Keep the great words coming in and we're going to move on. So again, we're focusing on promoting. Let's move on to one of these other four. And next one is going to be about learning. So uh, Name one resource that you use to educate yourself about the care of others and the care of older adults. What do you go to to teach yourself? Okay, podcast, Wayne, Jags, Curbsiders podcast. Uh, Rashmi Sharma is leading DEI committee in Cambria Health Palliative Care Center of Excellence. Oh, that's that goes back to something that we're proud of. Uh, how many of you are using textbooks to do it? Yeah, actually, I gave one of our uh, uh, in our medical students who started rotating with us on palliative care. Um, uh, the GRS to read quickly, uh, you know, four pages is about Parkinson's disease. So I'm not against textbooks. I think they play a role. I think there, there are, are a lot of other ways and potentially free ways that you can get your education too. Um, 
So Jesse agrees. I peek at hazards now and then. I use GRS more. I love GRS because it's so like condensed and you can, I think it's great for interns and med students too. I, other things that I use is journal watch. So trying to pay attention to all of those different things out there, all of those journal articles is impossible. So trying to find places where you can um, learn about things um, in ways that otherwise, like I'm not going to read every one of these journals, like, uh, and certainly not like, you know, neurology. I think there are a lot of great articles in neurology, but I'm not going to look at neurology's table of contents. I read, um, uh, blog posts. So this is, um, uh, from BMJ. They're a great series of different podcasts that kind of summarizes evidence. I love podcasts too. So, um, Curbsiders. Uh, I was in one Curbsiders episode a while ago, um, and Leah Witt, who is one of our faculty at UCSF, um, also is part of that Curbsiders team now. I think they do amazing things from an internal medicine standpoint, and they're huge fans of geriatrics. Um, Joshua Ui was just on to talk about, um, God, I'm blanking on what topic he gave, but he just gave something that um, on geriatrics. Um, so they're doing great things. AMDA on the go, for those people who are working in nursing homes, I think it's also fabulous. Um, they've done a great thing last year around COVID uh, articles. Um, and again, if we want to promote the amazing thing that happens in uh, nursing homes, AMDA on the go is a great podcast to listen to. And we also have our own Jerry Powell podcast. So this is a podcast that Alex Smith and I created. Um, and we talk a lot, a lot of different things, things that interest us. So our, our topic this week was nudging in medicine. Is it ethically justifiable to nudge our patients in particular directions? Long story made short, I think we nudge people all the time just based on framing. So are we going to use mortality or survival first? That's going to nudge somebody. Are we going to say, based on everything that you're telling me um, about what's important to you, this is what I think we should do. Or this is the reason why I don't think doing CPR on you would make any sense. I think that by itself is a nudge. We're using um, uh, their idea of making sure that um, they are ego consistent or their values have been stated consistently. So they're less likely to go against what we say. If we start off with based on what you've said, because they want to seem consistent. So that's a nudge in itself. We're coming from a place of authority. So that's potentially a nudge. Um, so we're nudging all the time. Um, uh, I think the key is to be mindful. And I think that was a really, um, and that's why I love doing these podcasts. I learn from them all the time. Um, uh, for example, this is one uh, with David uh, Jerlink about tramadont, all the diff dangers of tramadol, um, uh, which I actually loved. Uh, listen to the podcast if you want to know uh, what the uh, similarity is, is between a kid and a, um, a goth teenager. And we just did one with Randy Curtis on living with and studying serious illness, um, which I thought was incredibly powerful. Yeah. And, um, you know, you guys get to be with Randy all the time. So it's amazing when we get a chance to be with Randy too. So this is our setup pre-COVID. Uh, you can see we got our microphones, we got our mixers. Um, unfortunately, this is our setup now post-COVID. Looks much like this. Um, all over Zoom. Uh, this is in the middle there. You got Alex and his guitar with his kids on the side. Um, and this is a podcast we did on, we published an article in New England Journal on family meetings and we brought everybody together. Again, this idea of post-publication uh, dissemination is not enough just to get an article published in the New England Journal. You got to promote it. You got to get eyeballs looking at your article. And if you don't, why even publish it if you don't want somebody to read it? So really working on that. And I think that's the hard part too, is that this is uh, the growth of our Jerry Powell podcast. So you can see in the first year that we started, it was a little later in the year, 3,000 plays of the Jerry Powell podcast. The next year it grew 25,000. And this is over the course of the year. Then 88,000 in 2018, then 171,000. And uh, over a quarter of a million in 2020. 
And this is a podcast aimed at geriatrics and palliative care. Like our audience base is not all of internal medicine. Um, it is not all healthcare professionals. It's all healthcare professionals who have some interest in geriatrics and palliative care. Um, and we're at a rate right now of breaking our, the quarter of a million record for 2021 for Jerry Bell podcasts. And that's something, you know, I'm particularly proud of, but more importantly, man, I love learning on each one of these podcasts. I think they're, they're a great way just for me to actually stay up with the literature, being able to talk to all of these great people. So podcasts I listen to, Jerry Pal, Curbsiders, Amda, and the one that you're going to make. It's actually not hard. You got a microphone, you got a video, you got Zoom. You can create your own podcast. Um, I would argue that you should get a better microphone, kind of like this one, if you're going to do it, um, because the one death knell for a podcast is really bad audio. Um, but luckily, nowadays, your computer microphones are better. Just don't use like headset microphones. And if you want to learn more, we actually created a Jerry Powell podcast guide, how to create your own hospice and palliative care podcast, and honestly, geriatrics too. So um, uh, um, if you're interested in it, happy to talk you through it. I've talked to other people. So there's some other great podcasts. Red Hoffman created one around surgical palliative care. That's great out there that we helped with. Um, so don't be scared. You know, lots of different ways you can get involved in social media. And I think podcasting is a great one. All right. So moving on. Dissemination. We're going to move from disseminating to connecting. So I think ultimately, especially for junior faculty members, it's a great way to connect with people that you otherwise wouldn't have really connected with. And especially for me, there's a lot of great names and big names in both geriatrics and palliative care that are on social media, in particular Twitter. You're interested in delirium, Sharon Inouye on Twitter. Um, I was happy I actually helped Sharon Inouye get on Twitter. Um, but it's a great way just to connect with them, ask them questions. Um, and honestly, when I think about myself, this is a talk from Twitter tw tenure. So I'm going to talk, A, there's no such thing as tenure at UCSF. But if there was, I'd like to talk to the junior faculty, to the fellows, to the applicants on the call. This is a great way just to connect with people. And from a promotion standpoint, because I see Angela brought up a promotions committee question. Um, you know, our promotions committee doesn't care what we do on social media. They don't look for it. But man, if you look at my application package when I was a junior faculty member, um, uh, a lot of them were people that I connected with online through Twitter. Um, uh, and people who I otherwise probably wouldn't have had, you know, much interaction with. I had some great interactions with online, kind of this asynchronous dialogue. Um, that was really helpful for me as a junior faculty member. And in my promotions letters from them, they highlighted the work that I did in social media. We created a blog early on, and that was a big part of my letters. And, and honestly, too, is that um, some of it was uh, I started writing on the blog. People started thinking, hey, Eric can write. Let's invite him to join us on this article that we're writing. And that was fabulous. Like I became a lead author on an article with a bunch of senior authors because they thought, hey, Eric, you know, let's invite Eric to join us, which was a huge honor, a little bit daunting because A, I still don't think I'm a good writer, but writing is like a muscle. You got to exercise it. And the blog helped me exercise that muscle of writing. Uh, so another way that actually helped me from a promotion standpoint, despite our promotion committee not looking at things like podcast tweets and things like that. You know, some places are, I think Mayo is an example that are, that's looking at, you know, using um, social media as part of their promotions package. I think most academic centers don't, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't influence kind of your promotions package. All right. So other ways to connect too. again, I just, I'm not going to just focus on Twitter or Facebook, I think there are great things that you can also connect with um, within our own um, national society. So my AGS online, uh, great places to actually learn from others 
and to help others with challenging things that they're facing. So actually going on to the My AGS Online site and talking with our colleagues is another way to connect asynchronously from places outside of our institution. And again, historically, this was like through society special interest groups. I think this is another great way to do that. Same thing with AHPM. Get to connect with others about things that they're kind of working on or worried about or having difficulty with. So that's connect. I'm gonna just look at the, the chat. I see uh, um, Angela's question about how do promotions committee look at things like podcasts, et cetera. Again, I don't think that most of them do, but I'm not gonna say that it doesn't help. And I think it certainly helped me. Um, and the question is, or should we wait until we're full professors to do it? I would say no. I think, um, you know, I think it's hard, right? You don't wanna say something on social media that you think is going to hurt you, let's say land your next job or hurt you in your promotions. And I think that's the really hard part about social media is that there, there is risk. There's risk about um, uh, making your voice heard. However, I actually think there's a huge amount of benefit of it. If it's done respectfully um, and also done kind of professionally as well, um, you know, I don't air all of my grievances out on social media and I try to be very respectful of my colleagues and my institutions. Sometimes I slip and, um, I apologize and I move on. Um, uh, but you know, the reason we go into academics, the reason we write articles and editorials is not to just to play it safe or not. Um, and I think this is the heart of geriatrics and palliative care in order to to change how we care for older adults with serious illness, we also have to acknowledge all the things that are going wrong and then potentially point to areas where we can improve um, and solutions. And I think that's the role of social media um, for us. It, and also, again, like I said, highlighting the amazing work that each of us are doing. All right, I'm gonna move on. We've got about 15 minutes late. I want, I want some time for questions and I'll look at the chat. And the last one is around teaching. So I think it's a great place, social media, to learn how to tweet. So we created a blog, the Jerry Powell blog. This came out before the podcast. Um, our number one uh, downloaded article on our podcast was the dangers of fleet enemas um, and all the things that are potentially wrong, including uh, phosphate nephropathy that we get with them, especially for older adults. And why you can still like go down the aisle of Walgreens and buy it. And that's a great way when we think about teaching, it's not just teaching med school, med students or interns. It's a great way to teach a lot of people. And again, it's not just healthcare professionals that were looking at this article because you can Google dangers of fleet enema. Historically, it was in the very front page. I'm not sure. I don't think it is anymore, but you can see on the bottom here that you see when you google fleet enema at least when i did this a couple of years ago um it came up uh, uh and this was an older article too so um uh, happy about that but other things that we did so we did a hashtag thick and liquid challenge where we um challenged people to try thickened liquids for 12 hours and see can they tolerate it themselves and then also talked about the evidence base for thickened liquids. Like, why do we use them? Why do one out of 12 nursing home patients use thickened liquids? There must be amazing randomized controlled trials showing that this stuff works. No. Um, what are the harms? And we know every intervention in a, has a harm. So um, we actually uh, uh, had interns create videos um, on uh, the Thicken Liquid Challenge. So this is one of our intern who was on palliative care. She did a Thicken Liquid Challenge video. I'm not gonna show the whole thing, but I just wanna, she walked you through her 12 hours and in the very end of the day, let's see if I can get it. Uh, uh, I'm gonna find it, don't worry. Here it goes. She says at the end of 12 hours, hopefully you guys can see the video, thirsty pretty much the entire day, headache persistence in six, six, headache persistence in six hour, urine output less than 50 cc's. And she was a healthy intern and that was happening with her. 
So really thinking about the role of um, these interventions, and it's a great place to share our knowledge. It doesn't mean traditional outlets like journal publications don't matter. And I think from a publication, from a promotions package, they absolutely do. But what happened here is we first did the challenge, put it on the blog, we put it on YouTube, use Twitter, and then that turned into a teachable moment in JAMA IM led by our intern on palliative care, uh, Christina Wang, on the horrible taste of nectar and honey, inappropriate use of thickened liquids in dementia. And it was great because what happened is that more people created videos on it. Um, so you can actually just uh, go on YouTube or Google hashtag thick and liquid challenge. Um, and people from across the US and internationally tried the thick and liquid challenge too. So it was great seeing that, you know, um, other people are doing it as well. Most recently, I actually learned this is that, um, uh, uh, the Miralax and Thicken Liquid. So uh, we did a video um, on why you should never mix Miralax with starch-based thickeners. Um, hold on, I'm just gonna stop my video for a second. I, I think I'm just gonna share sounds. All right, I'm gonna go back to my PowerPoint. All right, so uh, does anybody know what happens when you mix Miralax and starch-based thickeners? Yeah, Kate says, I do have a video. That was one of the videos. It was a little longer, but I have a video of uh, Kate uh, doing the Thick and Liquid Challenge. Anybody know what happens? Volcano. Angela, I love that idea of this <laughs> volcano. <laughs> yeah, so I see uh, Thin Liquid. So here's a video that we did on uh, mixing Miralax and thickened liquid. So I take two glasses of thickened liquid, right? They look the same. It's like Hormel, was it Hormel chili where the test was, does, it, does the spoon stand up? Again, this is thicker than honey thickened, um, but it's just to show you like what happens with. Now I'm gonna add some Miralax, Miralax which is polyethylene glycol, peg, which is basically go lightly without the electrolytes in the very small dose. And notice what happened. I just turned thick liquids into thin. I'm a magician. Isn't that pretty amazing? So, um, I think it's a way that, again, that we can educate people about the things that we learn. Um, and this is something I learned. I brought it into our nursing home and we talked about it. And pharmacy created a pathway for people who are Miralax and thickened liquids which includes um, making sure that if we're going to be mixing it, mixing it with um, not starch-based thickeners, but gum-based thickeners, which that doesn't happen with. So last exercise, what's an educational fun video that you want to make? And put it in the chat. Something it could be anything about geriatrics or palliative care, or importantly, self care. Anything else that you you you're teaching your interns, your med students, interdisciplinary team members. This is a harder one. I saved the hardest exercise for last. Maybe it's about family meetings, goals of care, falls. Okay, as people type, I'm gonna finish up. So we've talked about promoting, learning, disseminating, teaching, and connecting. Five things that I use social media for five things that we use social media for from our division standpoint, trying to create uh, an ecosystem. When we and when we created the JAGS, so I think it was 2006, 
2016, I came aboard on JAG's Journal American Geriatric Society as their social media editor. Um, and these were the, the things that we wanted to make sure that we addressed. Heavy focus on dissemination. When people publish in JAG's, how do we help them promote their own articles? And working with AGS to make sure that geriatricians are on social media, creating social media accounts on JAGS, we're on um, Instagram, uh, Twitter, Facebook, um, uh, and LinkedIn to promote the JAGS articles that we see. Recognizing that we're on everything. We're not like on Snapchat or TikTok. Um, uh, you can't do everything. And I think that's the important part. Don't feel like you have to do everything, but trying at least a little bit to make sure that we're not just stopping at the, like the publication standpoint. That publication isn't enough. There has to be post-publication dissemination. That's what we wanted to work on from a JAG standpoint to get more people reading JAG's articles. And I think that's a great place for a division to do too. So with that, um, I want to make sure that we have some time for questions. And I'm going to read just a couple of the things um, uh, that I, I saw on the tweet chats as, as far as the, the chat, as far as um, if videos we want to create. Could show a video about the dangers of throw rugs. Love that. I'm unlikely to do this, but making a video about being a doctor patient would be enlightening to others. Um, thank you, Laura. And David, watching a master clinician communicator at work. Love that. Okay. The using assistant devices can, can be fun and allow you to explore outside the community and how to use an assistant devices, device properly. A video on preventing back pain with Pilates. Um, uh, Lauren likes your, your video idea. Uh, okay. Um, and Austin, a fun video for teaching medical students on how to assess and remember ADLs and IADLs. That would be amazing. You should absolutely do that, Austin. So um, I am going to end my talk. Um, I'm going to keep this um, uh, QR code up. I think this QR code goes to evaluations um, uh, for this talk, but I wanted to open up for thoughts, questions, things that you disagree with, really anything that you have. Eric, this Wayne, I want to chime in and, and thank you for uh stimulating talk. And I wanted to address Angela's stuff about promotion yeah. uh, from another angle. I, I'm a division head. So I spend a lot of time trying to get people promoted and working on it. Uh, and my main challenge is getting uh, recalcitrant doctors to brag about themselves. Very difficult. People are all not inclined to brag about themselves. They don't know how. So I do a lot of coaching on bragging. And uh, the, what's, what's beautiful about uh, social media is I think it might help people brag about themselves uh, in ways they're more comfortable with. One challenge these days is the promotion committee is struggling with uh, items that have to do with quality improvement and diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, and you have to get it on your CV to brag about it. So the nice thing about a podcast is, is it's a label. You know, you can write it on one line on your CV. The more that those things start to appear on CVs, the more promotion committees have to consider it. it and we've already told the UW community that DEI activities and QI activities count to promotion, but you have to list it and figure out how to disseminate it to take credit for it. So this, this is a pathway to do that. So the answer to Angela's question is yes, it's, it's going to start counting uh, and it's probably a good idea to use it. Yeah. Great points. I think that that's, that's a really hard point. It's it, self-promotion is, is really hard. Um, I think it's much easier for people to promote the amazing things that each, all of us are doing. So in some ways, you know, dipping your toes, it's fine if you don't talk about the things that you're doing or your publication, but at least pair up with somebody, pair up with somebody to promote each other's work. I see another question about, um, going back to Debbie's question about time and how you have found the time to grow your social media empire. Do you have protected time to do this work? Um, man, uh, 
initially it would it really started with the labor of love and i think that's that's the hard things about academics sometimes is the things that you care about most are the things that um uh the university doesn't want to pay for um uh, so for example we started the jerry pal podcast and it was just me and alex doing it on our you know spare time um and growing it i still think it was it's probably the thing that i've enjoyed the most in academics um is uh growing the jerry pal blog and then podcast and being on twitter um and no it was never supported by the division but we finally did actually ask for um foundation funding so we're supported now by the archstone foundation um so part of mine and alex's salary um after it's grown and for our podcast is supported by archstone foundation and we're thinking about different ways that we can continue that support um in a way that we still feel is ethically okay like we don't want big pharma to be supporting our podcast that's just me and alex it's fine if somebody else does but thinking about foundations or potentially um uh, uh, thinking about how to potentially running ads for, uh, you know, institutions looking to hire geriatricians or palliative care docs, you know, some ways that we can do it without having to, um, push for drugs or other things like that is something that we've been thinking about. So it really, but that, that was probably a good eight or nine years into doing the, into Jerry pal that we actually started getting supported to do it. And most people are not being supported to be on Twitter. I would say though, post publication dissemination should be part of like the idea of any grant. Like how are you going to get, make sure that people are uh, reading what you're doing or implementing what you're doing. And I think social media plays a role and we're starting to see more of that. And I certainly have had to write letters to, um, about other people's grants, about how we can help them with uh, dissemination of their work when they're applying for a grant. All right. See so question from Angela. How do we deal with social media in the landscape of social media being well bad for us sometimes? Referring to a recent report about Facebook's contributing to poor health of teens and increasing COVID misinformation. Is it better to hang on and fight that or to log off? I really struggle. I struggle with this one too. I think this is incredibly hard. There are times where I just want to delete my Facebook account. I think, you know. Part of me feels it's fundamentally evil or uh, associated with bad things. Um, uh, and um, I also feel like, you know, it potentially is also a tool used for good. So we still post like our, our podcasts and things like that on Facebook to help spread the word and potentially help change people's minds. Um, uh, so I don't have a clear answer for that. I, I think I use actually Facebook much less nowadays, <laughs> um, because of some of the things that, you know, read about and certainly don't uh, have my kid on Facebook right now. Um, uh, um, but I do feel like there's still a role for us getting the message out there. I use for me in particular, I use Twitter a fair amount, um, from um, both a, you know, geriatrics palliative care and also just a general internal medicine standpoint. I do feel like correcting some information, but also recognizing you can't do everything. Just because somebody, somebody wrote something stupid on Twitter, it is not my responsibility to fix everything, all the misinformation out there. And I think just like everything else in medicine, trying to find the boundaries, I'm putting our boundaries up there too, when I'm gonna do this and when I'm not, and it's not gonna take over all of my non-work time. So making sure you've created boundaries and rules about when you're gonna be using social media at home. And I would definitely set those rules up for yourself. So with that, I recognize we're out of time. I wanna thank everybody for joining me today. If you have any questions, feel free to tweet me uh, at eWidera um, and we can have a conversation online. You can also email me at eric.widera at ucsf.edu, but it's not as exciting, is it? Um, thanks everybody. Thank you so much, Eric.